Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Good morning everyone and welcome to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director of the museum. It's certainly no secret that test pilots must possess extraordinary skill and exercise exceptional ingenuity. It is also no secret that their profession provides them with unique experiences. But some experiences have to be considered more unusual than others, and taking off and landing a jet fighter plane on the surface of the ocean must be one of those extraordinary experiences. That is exactly what our guest today has accomplished, and he is going to share those details with us. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me to introduce to you B.J. Long. It's a privilege to be here, and it's a privilege to be anywhere, because in 10 days, I'm going to be 89 years old. I'm not trying to hide a bald head because I've still got hair. <laughs> now, I got to tell you what my background was that got me eventually to be the Sea Dart test pilot. First place, I was born in Johnson City, Tennessee, East Tennessee. I was uh, in 1923, February 28th, and I was a premature. I was uh, seven months, three pounds, a blue baby, didn't have any oxygen, and for five days I didn't have a name because I was supposed to have died. And, of course, that's what gave me my brain damage, but anyway, <laughs> my mom had wanted a girl and wanted to name her Bonnie Jean. And so, brace yourself, I came out Billy Jack. <laughs> And I think they, they, see they got B.J. there. Well, I'm really Billy Jack, but anyway. So I gotta give you a little background. When I was growing up, I, I had my first plane ride when I was six years old. I went with some other people, but anyway, I got fascinated by model airplanes and I built gas model airplanes, free flight. And I won several contests back in Tennessee and then when I'd, uh, I was in high school, I, I was really active. I was, my, I was pretty skinny kid and so on, but I became cadet commanding officer in the ROTC unit, Army ROTC unit, as a cadet major. And I am one in a track uh, uh, letter. I was running uh, on the 880 relay with all the big athletics, but I could run like hell. Though. So anyway, I did that. And then when I, I graduated, I skipped a half a grade in grammar school. And I, oh yeah, I better tell you this. I did a lot of things that hurt myself. Uh, I, broke, I broke my wrist and my hand was displaced clear up to the right and it's called eupiscible separation. And I, I broke my foot when I was young and it never was fixed right. And I hit a telephone pole on a sled and broke the shoulder and it's still broken. And of course, when I had my examination to go into cadet program, they said, you any broken bones? Not me. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, when I got out of high school, I half, I'd skipped a half a grade in grammar school. And as I said, I was cadet major, did all kinds. I was in a band for a short period of time, playing a trumpet. I could blow hot air doing anything. But anyway, <laughs> so when I got out of, uh, out of school there, it, it was in the depression days. And I went to work for an aircraft called Bristol Aircraft. It was part of Montecoupe Aeroplane and Engine Corporation. And it was, uh, it was owned by an oil, big oil company. And I, I got a job there and I, I learned to draw and, and I was an expert in drafting. I used to plot airfoils, did all kinds of things. And I got a job there. It was a, I was about the seventh guy in the, the engineering department. And I started off with big money, 32 and a half cents an hour, $13 a week. So anyway, I stayed there all during the war. In fact, the early part of the war, and I got a deferred. I didn't have to, I, from the draft because of my job there. And oh yeah, here's one. Everybody know what a Volte vibrator was? Okay. Volte built 10,000 Volte vibrators in Downey. 
they couldn't build them fast enough, so the Air, uh, Army Air Corps decided they needed uh, more parts. So they came to our company in, here in Bristol, Virginia, and we built molded plywood parts for the machine. I actually personally did the drafting and layout for a, a major portion of the things there. Now, we still had, we still had the metal tubular fuselage, but from the back seat, from the aft seat, the tail cone with all molded plywood parts with stringer, wooden stringers in there. The tail assembly was completely wooden parts, molded plywood, and also the wings were uh, molded plywood, and we even built a center section, which was a mistake because it, it was too heavy and it was too hard to maintain. Now, one thing, we knew such a little bit about things back in those days. Now, you'll know about this. Do you know the Volte vibrator had a little spoiler strip on the leading edge of the wing? The airplane was a symmetrical airfoil, and also it had no aerodynamic twist on it. And so you had to do something to make sure that, that the wings didn't stall out and you did, did this. So you're supposed to have a little aerodynamic spoiler strip on just outboard of the landing gear which would cause the, the, the uh, inboard section to start stalling before the outer part of the wing so you didn't do this. Well, anyway, oh, we got a production contract for the parts, everything except the center section of the wing, which was the right way they did it right. And they went to down in, that's where they were put together as part of the program. Now, now when I got to Pensacola and was going through basic training there, that phase of it, I made sure that when I got out to the flight line and one of them was one of the wooden airplanes, I was very careful. Did you hear that? I was very careful when I flew it. <laughs> anyway, oh, in the meantime, I bought Anderson in a Piper Cub of 40 horsepower, single ignition, no airspeed indicator and no brakes. And that's how I learned to fly it. So anyway, I'm not offending anybody here. But I didn't want to get in the Air Force, Army Air Corps, because I figured out I might end up being a, a bombardier or a navigator or something like that. I wanted to fly my own airplane. So I went down and took an exam for to go into the Navy Cadet Program, where you fly your own airplane. So I, I, they uh, passed me on the test, physical and so on, and I got called to active duty. And then I went through flight training. Now, I went through, uh, first I went through the flight preparatory school at the University of South Carolina, which was a nightmare. And they were always trying to hurt me. But anyway, then I went to WTS where we flew Piper Cubs out in West Tennessee, a place called Martin, Tennessee. And they were, the academics was tough and, and the physical training was tough. And then I went to pre-flight school in, in, uh, down in Georgia, in Athens, Georgia. Now, uh, the fellow that was uh, named that was later killed in the Cedar, it was named Charlie Richburg. And he was a very academic guy. He was brilliant and so on. And he became out, the outstanding cadet in my class at pre-flight school from the academic uh, information. So anyway, then I went to primary in Dallas, Texas. That was the biggest primary base in the Navy. We had hundreds of cadets there. We had officers going through, enlisted men going through flight training. We had foreigners and coming there in flight training, and we flew stearmans, two types of stearmans. We had Air Force stearmans and Navy stearmans. Now, the, I didn't like the uh, Air Force types because they had steerable tail wheels. The Navy had a full swivel with a with tail lock. So anyway, I'm just laughing about those things. And we had ones with different engines and so on. And I went through primary, got a we got more time than anybody else. We got 100 hours in Stearman. And then I got through that, I went to Pensacola, and we went through indoctrination and so on. Now here's the punchline of why I ended up being a Cedar Art test pilot. When I got to Pensacola, and by the way, and when I was in school uh, and growing up, I learned to swim. I really learned to swim, uh, breaststroke, uh, uh, backstroke, Australian crawl, I learned to dive and do everything. I, you know, I guess this. I learned what it does to when you impact water. You have to, you don't go in like a cannonball. You don't do a belly flop. You don't do this. You don't do that. So you have to enter the water and learn how to respect the impact with water. So when I when I was down when I finally got to Pensacola, I I saw the float planes. They had old N3N 
uh, biplanes there, and they had the OS2U Kingfishers. And I said, I don't, I want that. So, and I'm in Pensacola, I want to make sure I got it. And my class, a bunch of us got there, took 250. I, I went over to a yeoman. You know what a yeoman is? He's a clerk in the, in the Navy. And I came up to him and I said, here's my name and class number. I would really like to have the float planes. What do you like to have? What do you like to drink? And what do you like to smoke? <laughs> now, I, this, is a, this is the truth. This is the truth. And he says, uh, I want the... Uh, Russian vodka and so I, there were no liquor stores in Pensacola I went I was smart enough that I went over to the only hotel in Pensacola and I found the old bell captain and I says where can I get a bottle of vodka he says I got one back there and he says I said how much he says 25 bucks that was a third of my month's pay so I got that and went back by the PX and got I think three cartons of cigarettes and I says I hope I make it in about in a, about four days Five of us out of 250 got the float planes. Now that's how I ended up being a Sea Dart test pilot. <laughs> now we flew the N3Ns, an old biplane that was built by the Navy, and even after the war, they were using them to tra train uh, Naval Academy guys back there in, in the, up in the bay, up near the Naval Academy. Now there's my first float plane. It was the N3N float plane. And that's how I got started. I told you how I got started in those things in the flight training program. But anyway, then I flew the OS2U Kingfisher. Anybody know what the Kingfisher was? All right, I see some good hands here. That was a, one of the most magnificent machines ever built. It only had a 450 horse engine in it and had uh, the f f flaps. If you put, crank the flaps down, uh, the, the, uh, you keep cranking them and the ailerons would start drooping too and then you had spoilers coming out so that you could actually fly that thing at about 45 knots. And there's my old Kingfisher, which is one of the greatest airplanes I ever flew. And like I said, it, it was really fantastic. And I got over 200 hours of those things. Anyway, you know, we done to all kinds of training uh, out to sea, navigational flights. In the meantime, I learned to do a lot of navigation, a lot of navigation and plotting boards and so on. And Anyway, I got my wings on the Kingfisher, and <clears throat> then I went through operational training there. Then I went to the West Coast, and the war was still going on. And then in the meantime, what had happened, they'd had the invasion, uh, the European invasion over there, and that was going on like, uh, like crazy. I got my wings, and I came to the West Coast, and I went up to uh, Alameda, and I saw a thing called the SC-1 Seahawk. Anybody know what the SC-1 Seahawk was? See, I haven't got, don't see many people there know that. But that was like a fighter, a single, a, a 1,350 horsepower, four-bladed prop, and a single float, wingtail floats, and so on. And Curtis had built that, and they had a lot of problems with it. They killed some bunch of guys in it because things had taken over the hydraulic system, and so on. Now, there's my old SC-1 Seahawk, not old. That's the Curtis SC-1 Seahawk, right after I'd gone off the catapult. And... Uh, they'd had a lot of mechanical problems with that airplane, but they, su they survived, and I was, became the hot pilot in that thing. And there I am, uh, coming off the end of the catapult, the SC-1. They're getting ready to be launched on the SC-1. And there is an SC in Japan uh, when I was uh, going off a ramp there. And there I am coming back after a mission, or uh, flight in SC-1 Seahawk. You see the little hook on the bottom of the center part of the ski? I mean, the float up there? As they say, when you come up and get on the sled there and back off, that hook would hook into the sled and you'd be towed then so they could uh, bring you aboard. And also getting ready to get hooked up. And, oh yeah, another thing they did, they, uh, since it was a single seater, I'd have to stand up in the cockpit, lean over, I'd break it, and open up uh, the thing for the hook, for the hook, the, the crane to hook up to. And of course, one time they hit me in the head with the hook. That, that's, that's what gave me my further brain damage, but anyway. <laughs> there it is. It was quite an airplane. Anyway, I got into those, and, and then also when I was out at Al up there, up there at uh, Alameda, I flew the, the, the Wildcat, the uh, 
the FM2, we call them FM2, they were like F4Fs. And I flew those, and then I, I was wheeling and dealing, and I got hooked up to get on the USS Santa Fe, this, which was there, we had the other pilots there and so on, and it was back in dock, and I got on board, board the Santa Fe, it was, it was four of us pilots there, uh, two uh, older guys, they'd already had their combat duties and everything, and the, and the old kingfishers and so on. Anyway, we went to the Pacific, and we were at Okinawa, and they had the big typhoon in Okinawa just before the war ended, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people died on the beach, and the ships just rolled over. I was on the bridge of this cruiser, and it, so I, I stood there, and it was rolled 56 degrees, 11 degrees, right, 45 degrees, and the ocean looked like mountains, uh, uh, and so on, and I, I even saw uh, destroyers roll over and just go like this, split ass to the bottom. Uh, that's what we were li living through. Anyway, we went on and headed, and we were going to go in the invasion of Japan. Well, in the meantime, they dropped the bombs. Hiroshima and then Nagasaki. And so we headed on in and we and, into Kyushu, and we're going to uh, uh, go in and have the Japanese in Kyushu, the southern big island of Japan, part of Japan, and we had the Admiral on board, and we had the Japanese in charge of Kyushu to come aboard and sign the surrender agreement and all the things they had to do. Here is the Admiral in charge of the, island, the main uh, lower part of uh, Japan coming aboard to sign the surrender agreements with his staff. Right there. Now get this. Being a wheeler dealer, like I was when I was a kid, I had all, as soon as I got aboard the ship, I became ship's photographic officer. So I made sure that three people got photos, the admiral, the captain, and me. <laughs> <laughs> Am I, was, that, was that okay? So anyway, I had fun doing that. And also, because I was such a wheeler dealer, I became engineering officer for our aviation unit. So I controlled all that, and I had all the, the uh, mechanics and everything else uh, working for me. So I, w I, w I was doing real well. So I did so well that when, it, uh, oh yeah, and it was in the initial occupation of Japan, and I told you, and I'd become ship's photographic officer, I went to, uh, I flew over Nagasaki and got aerial pictures of Nagasaki, and I've got them in my book that I published, which is right here. And there is Nagasaki. I took these pictures myself, flying the SC-1. That's after the bomb had been hit. That was the second bomb dropped in Japan. And there is another shot of Nagasaki. Thousands of people were killed, and it was tragic, but I guess that's the thing we had to do to get them to stop. Then we went on up to northern Japan, and we went, uh, I went ashore up there, and I was flying Wildcat fighters up there, just running around having a get like a kid in a toy shop and so I was going to uh, I'd done so well that the senior officer there said they call me Billy Jack by the way it's Billy Jack they said why don't you apply for regular Navy and I said oh no I get this I'm going back to going back to Tennessee and go to school on the GI Bill and starve to death <laughs> <laughs> so anyway that's what I did I, I got out when I came back to the states, and uh, then what happened? Remember the Berlin airlift? And they had to wall around Berlin. Well, in the meantime, I'd been I'd, I'd joined the reserves. I was going to the University of Tennessee, and I joined the reserve down in Atlanta, and I was flying uh, Hellcats down there, and I uh, so I, I applied to go back on active duty then because things were getting kind of slow uh, as far as financially. And I went back on active duty, went to a utility squadron up in Rhode Island. And then I went, to, here's the best duty I ever had. I went to Chincoteague, you ever heard of Chincoteague, Virginia? Have one, two, two, three, four. It's Chincoteague was out on the coast of Virginia. And I went to a, 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 a VX2 a, a development squadron. And we had F6F drones and TD-2C culvers. You know what a TD-2C cover was? It went one or two guys, it was a, like a cover cadet, only it was a, designed purely as a drone. And so I became a drone control pilot, a big shot, and I'd 
Like for instance, I'd go out for the Atlantic fleet and I'd be flying a Hellcat up here with no pilot in it, red, painted red, and, and I, my control plane was blue with yellow wings. And when I was getting it lined up on a ship out in the Atlantic, I'd say, the drone is painted red. My control plane is blue with yellow wings. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, I'd make runs on those things. And occasionally I got one shot down and I came back. But in the meantime, I guess I'd learned to be a wheeler dealer. Uh, I became the, in operations also, I was the guy that did all the paperwork for the captain there who was a, eventually became an admiral later on. And I became, and I was the one that checked him out in a Bearcat. He thought that was great. And I had all the other guys that had been combat and everything else, but I did that. Well, let me tell you, uh, I became the staff officer for all the paperwork. And, and that's when the, after the, that part of the, the economy was down, and they were getting less and less money. So I'd made up all the paperwork for the Admiral to go down to see the, the highest ranking Atlantic fl fleet guys, and I got more, we got more money. Anyway, I figured, well, I've, I've done as much as I can do in this thing, so I'm gonna get out and go back to active duty, uh, in active duty. And I went back to the University of Tennessee and was working my civil engineering degree. Anyway, and now I've got a test for you. You ever heard, anybody here ever heard of the AM-1 Martin Mauler? What, about four? Uh, that, that was a big dive bomber, attack bomber. Had a 4360 engine in it, 28 cylinders, 56 spark plugs, seven magnetos, four bladed prop, and uh, with one, one pilot, and that was it. And by the way, that airplane was built by Martin, and it never got into combat duty. It was in a bunch of several uh, squadrons, and it was so dangerous, we had some guys that got killed in it, but I had a couple of near accidents in it. But anyway, I survived that. And then what happened was the Korean War broke out. So what happened was I, I decided I wanted to go back on active duty. So I took a Martin Mauler, flew it into Washington, D.C., into Anacostia there, and I got a, a, a bus to go over there, and I went to a Navy personnel, and I walked in. I was just a, a lieutenant of junior grade, and I had did khaki pants on an overseas cap, and I came up to this guy, and it was a lieutenant, I says, you need any drone control pilots? He says, uh, well, he answered me, now, this is a God's truth. He says, where do you want to go? I says, what do you got? He says, I got Miramar in California. I says, I'll take it. <laughs> so, <laughs> what happened? He says, your orders are, it, it will be in the mail. So I flew the Martin Muller back to Atlanta, got out, went back home, uh, in Knoxville, and in two days, I had my orders to active duty, came back during the Korean War. So what happened, I came out to Miramar, and I was back in the drone business. Well, we were so overstaffed and everything, that, and I, was, I built model airplanes and so on, that I decided I wanted to go to the little target drone school, the little small pilotless aircraft with a little uh, engine up in the front, and I went out to El Centro, and learned to fly those things. Came back and I was skipper of a little target drone unit, but I could still get my flying time in when I wanted to. And here I am when I got into the small target drone unit and I was on a ship there and they used to fly those out for t target practice for the ships to shoot at. So what I did then, what I did then was to, uh, uh, they were asking for volunteers to go certain things. And I wanted to be a real prince or king or whatever. And I volunteered to go on to USS Wisconsin, which was the flagship for the seventh fleet in the Pacific, and the flagship. And so I was, had a little target drone unit on the, that unit, the thing that we used for target services to and from the bomb line. It wasn't a combat weapon or anything. And so I was a full lieutenant, which is like a captain in, a, in the Air Force. But anyway, I did that. And oh yeah, one time when we were up there, uh, near the uh, Korean border, uh, we got hit uh, by b beach guns, and I was standing on a fantail, and we got the ship got hit by some uh, some guns we were shooting inland. But anyway, uh, and we had a couple of guys that were injured real bad and so on. But that was my only combat star. I was uh, on that battleship when we got hit by uh, beach guns. Anyway, I came back. So then what I did, I came back and 
I went uh, uh, back to, for, in the drone unit, and because I'd been on the battleship Wisconsin, which was a flagship for the fleet, uh, and I'd had a good record there, uh, when I got back to San Diego, they thought, well, we're going to reward you. So I was the first guy in our utility squadron in San Diego that got checked out in jets. And so well, I went to a, a jet school, and by the way, they were, they were T-33s, the two-seater Air Force. They had mile-an-hour gauges in them, not, didn't have not gauges. <laughs> and they didn't have ejection seats in them, and it, it was a kind of a raunchy airplane, but that's how I learned to fly jets. And so after that, uh, the guys up in Point Magoo, anybody know where Point Magoo is? You see, got a lot of, everybody knows where Point Magoo. I went up to Point Magoo to, uh, because they had heard that I had, had a good record in target drone units and in the drone business and so on. And I was actually, they worked it through and requested me by name to come up there. So I, I went up there and I got into the Regulus program, which was a classified program. That was a nuclear weapon system. To, it was to be delivered like a, a load flying uh, air, air, airplane, not a, up high like this, and and uh, to to go out and hit targets. Well, it was a it was a secret thing, and, and so what happened was, I got assigned as a collateral duty to be in the regulars training team, a bunch of a holes. Anyway, the guy the guy that had been uh, was the skipper of it. He was still a lieutenant. I don't know, he'd been passed or what anyway. He was in the original, one of the original Blue Angels teams. And I, I had to fly, make, and so to play like we had a regular program, a regular vehicle, we'd have a, 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 an F-80 over here, which is a, a single-seater jet, Lockheed jet, and we'd have somebody in it riding safety pilot in it. And we'd fly, uh, take it off and I would be in the back seat of this T-33 or TV-2, and I'd be controlling the drone, and uh, then we'd practice for all the, with these things. Well, it got so bad, I figured I was going to get my fanny killed if I stayed in that outfit. So I, I was just all burned out. And so I heard about San Diego and what they were doing down at uh, Convair. So I decided to get out, and I went to went to got a job in San Diego in the flight test department. When I first got to Convair, for a while I was scheduled to be the number two pilot in the Pogo. I didn't need that, but anyway, by the way, in the Pogo, what he had to do to, to come back and land, he'd, he'd take off vertically like this. When he came back to land, he'd come buzzing across like this, zoom way up and he'd be over 1,500 feet high here and have to back down from high altitude, like this. It was a nightmare. There is the Pogo. I was a chase pilot on an AD-5 when he was in the horizontal flights. And there's the R-3Y, the Herbert Prop flying boat that Convair was building. See, Convair had been in the flying boat business. They didn't have a lot of experience in fighters and this sort of thing. And they were trying, and at that time, the Navy and so on, everybody was playing around with new designs. Now, here's a digressing a little bit. That, back, that's back in the days when the economy was still good. So we, my, me and my wife and my first wife, we bought a, bought a house there in, San, in La Jolla. Anybody know where La Jolla is? All right, you see, I got you now. I, 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 I was able to, I bought a house for 21.5, it was a three bedroom, get this, it was on the ocean side of La Jolla, overlooking the ocean, it was up on the hill there, overlooking the ocean, you could see clear down to the Mexican islands down there, and I bought that thing for 21.5. Now, about a year ago, I heard it was, they'd added, of course they'd added, I'd seen it since then, they'd added a second floor to it, but it was for, for one and a half million, because of the location. See, I didn't do that too well, but anyway. <laughs> so I, I, I went into the, that, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit later, but after I was on the CDART program, which I'll, I'm gonna be covering here, uh, that's when, uh, I'll get into the details on that. 
But after I was on the Sea Dart program, I'd done so well after Richburg was killed and so on that we had three Navy commanders come out from Pax River and they wanted to get checked out in the Sea Darts, uh, the single and the twin ski airplane. And so I gave them a cockpit check out and uh, coached them what to do and to fly them in and out of San Diego Bay. And they, they thought that I'd done such a good job, I'll never forget this as long as I live. Uh, they said, they called me, and by the way, my name was Billy Jack, not BJ. So anyway, they say they call me, Billy Jack says, why don't you come back to Navy Test Pilot School? I says, why well, can't, I'm just a reserve, and I'm still flying in the reserve. They says, we think you can make it, we're on the selection board. <laughs> so when, as soon as the Sea Dart program was over, I, I went back to Navy Test Pilot School and talking about wheeling and dealing, while I was there, I still drew my reserve monthly pay <laughs> And, and the convert pay, which well, it wasn't rich in those days, but anyway. And then when I got through, uh, I was finishing up there, the operations officer says, they call me Billy Jack, he says, why don't you come, why don't you go down and, and get checked out on a carrier? I says, I've never flown it off a carrier. I flew flow planes. They says, well, we think we can rig that. So I went to Pensacola as a civilian and went through test pilot training and got 10 carrier landings as a civilian on the ship. <laughs> so how's that for willing and dealing? <laughs> so anyway, then when I came back, I, the, the chief engineering test pilot, he wasn't too happy with me because I'd taken over the sea dart program and whatever, I'll get into those things later. But anyway, uh, I went up to, went up to Edwards Air Force Base and like an idiot, I sold a house in La Jolla. Oh. And so anyway, I went up to, uh, to Edwards Air Force Base and I became a test pilot on the F-102. You know what that is? Yeah. And there's the F-102, which I flew. That was the first model of the F-102 that I flew. Well, the airplane, that wasn't that bad, except thing. I don't know why they did this, whether the Air Force called it. They the trainer version, instead of being a four and a half back seat, they had a side-by-side -side seat. And the student or the passenger would sit over here. And the canopy would open up like this, like a clamshell. And it was the most miserable thing I ever flew in my life. But anyway, I hate to say this, I'm trying to beat up on the guys, but they had a, a group of guys there. One of the test pilots, a senior guy, uh, he had had an accident, he couldn't fly anymore. And they had their own team, and they didn't like having a stranger coming in to be a part of their team. So I had a hell of a time up there. But anyway, after the, I did that, why? Well, that's when I, uh, I decided I'd had a belly full of that. And that's when I quit, and I went to work for a Fairchild back in Hagerstown. Did anybody know what the F-27 was in Fairchild? The Fokker airplane design was? Okay. I got a job for, at Hagerstown to be a salesman for F-27s. Now, how do you sell F-27s? You're on the road all the time, not flying the airplane, but out politicking and so on. And I did, I traveled everywhere. I was in Cuba before Castro took over. I was down in Venezuela during the revolution. And it, it was a nightmare. Uh, so then I decided I'd had a belly full of that. I left that and I did other things, but I ended up over here in Downey on the Apollo and the Space Shuttle program. I became the number one speaker on the Apollo and the Space Shuttle program for 25 years, all the United States, Europe, Canada, and everything, working with the astronauts. And uh, I traveled everywhere at wide open expense account, big exhibits, and that's how I met my wife, Winnie, here with me in Germany. <laughs> Here's some photos to show you. Here I am with the CDAR, twin ski CDAR. Okay, here I am in the uh, aircraft and at the CDAR. Also in the uh, aircraft. And there's a kind of seaplane heritage. And there's the CDAR in front of the museum in San Diego, twin ski. And there's the CDAR. Now let me dwell on this a little bit. 
the Convair had built flying boats, the PBYs, PB2Ys. So they were playing around with all those airplanes, and they they had built some Delta Wing experimental land-based test vehicles. But they shouldn't have built this thing. It was a nightmare. And I'm going to tell you all the things that were wrong with it. Now, there's a twin ski version and a single ski version. Now, uh, what I'm going to tell you about is the twin ski airplane was like a tuning fork. I don't have it here, but you take a knife and put it on the edge of the table and twang it, or a tuning fork. That's what the twin ski, uh, the twin ski did when it was traversing the waves, and the front struts were right under your fanny, and it was like sitting on a tuning board. It actually go blind. And I don't know they why in the heck they ever decided they wanted to do that, but they wanted a supersonic seaplane. Well, they didn't worry about uh, operating in the water. And now when we actually converted and did the, uh, I still flew with both of them till the end. Uh, there's the single ski, and it was it was retractable, but it wasn't aerodynamically right. Another thing that was wrong with the Sea Dart. It had a very, very thin wing, symmetrical airfoil. And you can imagine what that was like. So the only time that anybody ever went supersonic in the thing was uh, Richburg uh, did one. He was up about 35,000 feet and he shoved the nose down and he went supersonic. But again, it had no camber. It was a symmetrical, uh, so thin it was unbelievable. Even the F-102, had a cambered airfoil in it later on when they, when they built the F-102 Convair. And there's Sam Shannon, who was a real gentleman, and he, he was a, a head of, chief of engineering flight test at Convair. And I'd give you some idea of some of the heavy sea conditions that I tested uh, the airplane in. It was wild. And here I am with an admiral and they were thanking me for the good job I had been doing. Here I'm in front of the twin ski airplane. Now what happened was Richburg, I'll dwell on this a little bit, they had a big demonstration. Anybody ever been to Lindbergh Field? Okay. And you know, at Lindbergh Field, right behind it on the east end, you're coming down a hill with all kinds of uh, commercial buildings, uh, residents, and everything else, and you come down at that, and you have to get down and land on the, the runway. And, this, and then, to get in the ocean, you just step over west a little bit, and there's, there's the bay. That's how it worked. Well, Richburg was putting on a big demonstration on the F-102, and I was flying an AD-5. Anybody want to know what an AD-5 is? Okay, it was a side-by-side -side big thing of a dive bomber by Douglas. I was flying the airplane to make sure the area was clear, no other airplanes around. And I was over Lindbergh Field, and he, he started his run from uh, the east of San Diego. And he came across through there, and was making a run at about, oh, he was about, uh, about only about 1,000 feet up over the bay. And he fired the afterburner. And at that position, the afterburner caused the nose to pitch down because the afterburners, the engines were above the center of gravity of the airplane. So it pitched down. Now, now it wasn't just a sea dart. In those days, other airplanes, they had the full power hydraulic control systems and they were breakout forces. And you break it out, and then you had too much and you have to ch check it again. So he got into a pilot-induced oscillation on the second pitch down at over 500 knots the airplane came apart. And it impacted in, right there in the bay, and they got to him, and uh, he was in, uh, uh, in the, uh, the lower section there, still in the cockpit, and they got to him. Of course, he had been killed instantly, and he wasn't uh, dis dismembered or anything. He was just in together, but he had been just killed. His heart was clear up into his, up into his throat or whatever, but anyway, now, this is the day it happened. We had, they had demonstrated the R3Y, the turboprop flying boat. We had all kinds of military brass and uh, press people and everything out. The skis, the twin ski airplane, 
When they first built them, they had wheels on the back end of them. That was a nightmare. They, they, that was stupid as could be to do that. So then they had to, uh, they did, that, did away from that and they had some pointed after bodies and they didn't have wheels on them at that time. At that time they didn't. And they had a little dolly. You had to, to get off the, sea, uh, the, the beach there to get down the ramp. And then when you get into the water, the guys would take the thing, the little the wheels off, the little dollies off, and you'd be floating. And there's poor old Charlie Richburg, uh, who was engineering. I got to speak a little bit about Richburg. He got his wings in the Navy. And, and then Richburg and Sam Shannon, who was, a, who was a head of the flight test there, had been, had gone to MIT. And Richburg, after he got through flight training, and was out uh, on inactive duty at the end of the war. He never did again in combat. He went to MIT and he got a master's degree in engineering at MIT. Well, Germerod had been, a, as a military officer, had gone through MIT, MIT. So he thought, well, if you got an MIT degree, you can do anything. So what happened was, uh, Richburg was flying the airplane and they gave him, uh, they, he gave him a, complete charge of everything now when I was when I was in a Navy on the board of ship and I worked with all the crew and everything I had a good per personal relationship with all the crew members Richburg he was not a friendly guy it's not a, a criticism but he wouldn't he, he didn't want to talk to the crew and he didn't believe in the crew if we were going to taxi, we were going to do a taxi test the next day, he would come down to the ramp and run engines that night beforehand, worrying about it. Well, when, they, when I took over the program, they says, they say, they call me, and they learned to call me Billy Jack because it was a friendly op operation. And they say, what time do you want to run engines? I said, I don't run engines at night. You run the engines because you maintain them, and I'll know if they're working tomorrow night when they get in the airplane. So that, that we had a good relationship. And now back to the sea dart. There's the twin ski, and that's when we, they designed it so that the wheels would rotate and be under the, on top of the thing, and then they could rotate like this and be able to get down. Now there's a, the single ski. It wasn't fully retractable, but it would go flush, and that took care of that vibration problem. And it was a, a little bit, but I did, I did open sea landings with, with both airplanes, but this one I did some ex extreme open sea, <coughs> sea landings <coughs> offshore from California there. Now again, I want to remind you, they, had, they didn't know what they were doing. The sea dart had, the, the airfoil was not cambered, it was a symmetrical airfoil. It was only 2% thick, and that's the reason it came apart when, when Richburg was killed. There's a, the single ski, fully extended for a landing. You can see the little wheels. They would, I could get those down when I was approaching the ramp and it, I'd get ashore that way. And there's, there it is. Now you notice what a high angle of, angle of attack it was when you was touching down. And that's going into the bay from the ramp there it is, it partially retracted. It's about as much as you can get it retracted. And that's an, getting a little rough out there <laughs> because that made me feel real good, actually. And there it is coming, up, coming ashore, coming up the ramp with this new skis, I mean, with a, ski, a single ski with the little wheels that could be retracted. And there it is in the bay. And there it is, flotation. And you can see the little spray rails that are up on the fuselage there. That's me in the cockpit. And there's with Jado bottles taking off, and that's North Island over there. In the background, that's in San Diego Bay. Twin ski just landing in the, in the, the ocean there. There's a single ski in the ocean. And all the difference in the world. And there's a twin ski in San Diego Bay. The ocean tests uh, were a nightmare. 
I don't know what the Navy had in mind when they were trying to build this thing because when you think of the logistics that go with having a float plane, what are you going to do? Wait till you get to an occupied area and be able to operate in a, somebody in a protected bay? Or how, how do you operate? And those questions were never addressed. The first series of tests was conducted in San Diego Bay. All tests were conducted between October 1955 and January 1956. To better demonstrate spray characteristics at low speeds, this particular operation was filmed at 64 pictures per second, and directional control is maintained using water rudder, aileron, and asymmetric power. Banking the airplane with aileron and water rudder is the easiest and most natural way to maneuver. The procedure is similar to speedboat maneuvering. On this 180 degree turn into a crosswind, water can be seen entering the inlet ducts. Extended taxiing at this speed range in crosswind conditions causes a salt buildup in the compressor section, which produces a decay in thrust. A freshwater injection system was developed and is now on the airplane. This new system successfully purges the compressor section of the salt deposits, correcting the thrust decay problem. On this series of runs, fixed elevator positions from 15 degrees down to 10 degrees up were used. This run was made with a 5 degree down elevator into the wind. Takeoff time following afterburner light off was 28 seconds. This run, 10 degrees down elevator out of the wind. Takeoff time, 27 seconds. Here, the pilot is using a stick not fixed technique, but holding trim attitude in the fixed stick unstable region. Takeoff times were 25.5 and 28 seconds, with takeoff distances of approximately 2,300 feet. A total of 21 takeoffs of this type were made without difficulty. These two takeoffs and landings were made with a 90 degree 16 knot crosswind. The wing low crosswind correction method was used to hold the desired heading. Takeoff time from afterburner firing to liftoff was approximately 27 seconds. This landing was made at 14.7 feet per second sink with maximum oleo load of 42,200 pounds. The sea dart is designed for a maximum oleo load of 88,000 pounds. Following the sheltered water tests, operations were moved to the open sea four miles off the Southern California coast. The landing was made parallel to the major swell pattern and approximately 90 degrees to surface winds. Touchdown speed was 115 knots indicated airspeed. Landing and run out were routine. At speeds below ski emergence, bow spray is deflected down and out by the bow spray rails. When the ski emerges, the leading edge of the ski breaks the water surface with little disturbance, and as the speed is increased, the general spray pattern moves aft. For the takeoff, a technique was developed for optimum spray control. This involved heading the sea dart directly into the wind for ski emergence, firing the afterburners, and then making a sharp 90 degree turn to the desired takeoff heading. Liftoff was made in 26 seconds from afterburner light off. Following the takeoff, a normal 360 degree pattern was made for a touch and go run. Landing loads were similar in magnitude to those encountered in calm water at a sink speed of 11 to 13 feet per second. Afterburners were fired at approximately 80 knots indicated airspeed during the landing run out. Operation in this open sea condition was considered routine. The second open sea operation was conducted in a sea state five. Primary swells of six feet were running at 70 to 100 foot intervals. Secondary swells of two feet were imposed upon the major pattern and every seventh swell was between eight and 10 feet in height. One 12 foot swell was observed immediately before landing. The landing was made parallel to the major swell in approximately 90 degrees to the surface winds. The water conditions were very severe and far beyond that anticipated in the operational concepts of the design. 
This entire operation was filmed at 64 pictures per second, which slows down the action of the sea and gives an impression of calmness where such a condition does not exist. Although an operation in such heavy seas is not one that a pilot would care to endure as a daily task, the operation was considered successful and should influence future design considerations. On the takeoff parallel to the running sea, excessive up elevators were held which retarded longitudinal acceleration. This caused a series of premature liftoffs and heavy impact loads were experienced in the skipping that followed. Structural integrity, in spite of the severe pounding, was not impaired. Final separation from the water was made 40 seconds following the afterburner light off. The ocean tests uh, were a nightmare. I can tell you, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun at all. Although the pilot reported the landing was within the operating limits of the airplane, the takeoff run probably approached the limit takeoff capabilities of the airplane for the existing thrust to weight ratio. The final landing of the United States Navy's experimental sea dart on the waters of San Diego Bay was made without incident. The landing concluded hydrodynamic testing of the XF2Y1 single ski airplane. Convair had built PBYs and multi-engine flying boats and so on, and they didn't know what they were getting into when they did this. The sea dart was a lousy design aerodynamically and hydrodynamically. And that's it. So I'd be happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. He wants to know on some of those open sea tests that I almost break my back. I actually, I thought I was having problems and I was I actually knocked me unconscious just momentarily. I lost all consciousness. Yes. Let me, oh, that's a good question. Did you land in the wake of the ship? The ship made an, a turn in the water, so it gave a, sl a slick. That's the way I flew kingfishers and also the SC-1 Seahawk. The, the ship would turn and do a, a crosswind like this, and you were still in the wind. <coughs> but the main part of the slick was uh, there to protect you. And I'd taxi up in the slick and get up to the point where uh, they'd, they'd put the crane out like this and put the hook down. And like I said, with the SC-1, I'd have to stand up in the cockpit and break, break open the hoisting uh, hook. And of course, I told you one time it hit me in the head with the hook. Yes. He wants to know how I could turn the uh, thing when I'm taxiing on the seat arc. We had the, the, the water rudders on the back, you got to open them up to slow you down. And also, you could work them separately like this in order to turn the airplane. Plus, you'd use the ailerons too to give you some lift on, on the wings. That's the way you did it, just like you was flying an airplane. Yes, sir. Oh, he's worried about corrosion. Well, the Navy didn't worry about that. <laughs> no, it was pretty well protected. He wants to know if I lost engines from the water ingestion. Uh, I, I, I think maybe I lost an engine one time, but I, I never had that much problem with water ingestion. Yes, sir. Now, I got to tell you one other thing. Uh, here's an example. When I was flying the, uh, the SC-1 Seahawk, they, uh, uh, on the, the fuel tank, it was on the aft part of the ship for the aviation fuel. And you couldn't just have a tank and then get it down low because you had, a, in effect, with a little bit of fuel and a lot of air in it, you had a bomb as far as danger. So what would happen is you suck the fuel off the top of the tank and you let the seawater come in on the bottom. So you had seawater on the bottom and you had uh, uh, aviation fuel here. And the, the, the one day, that's when I had an engine failure with the SA-1, made a forced landing. And what happened, the guy hadn't kept good track and he'd used up all the fuel uh, on the top and of course, he got his butt in a, in a ringer with the skipper of the ship and so on. But anyway, <laughs> what aircraft landings did I, air carrier landings did I qualify in? That's very interesting because when I went through test pilot school, 
See, I'd never flown off a carrier. And so, and I went through as a civilian, but I got to be real buddy-buddy with, with the guys that ran the thing. And in fact, I wasn't, wasn't supposed to do it, but they'd give me an airplane to go on across the country. <laughs> anyway, so what happened was, there's one guy says, they called me Billy Jack, which was a friendly thing. And uh, I was a civilian and he says, Billy Jack, you, you want to go down and get checked out on a carrier? And I said, I sure do. He says, well, he says, well, I can fix it up. So when I finished test pilot school as a civilian, I went down to Pensacola and I got through carrier qualification by take, I mean, by landings with an SNJ and AT-6 on the beach, made several uh, simulated landings with a, with a guy going like this to get you cut and everything. And then I went out and in one day, I made 10 launches and landings on a carrier with an SNJ and AT-6. Now, it's an interesting thing. When I, we'd, we had to get turned back into the wind after I'd made about five landings, we had to head back out to sea again in the Gulf there to get the end of the wind for the, car for the landings. And so as a, uh, in the speaker system, says, Mr. Long, will you report to the captain on the bridge? And I thought, holy crap, what have I done wrong? <laughs> so I went up to the captain and I had my flight suit on. And he says, I just want to thank you for coming aboard and, and making your carrier landings here. And it was just a nice greeting, welcome. So I went back down and made uh, five or six, whatever it was, to get my 10 carrier landings and then flew back to Pensacola. <laughs> they want to know how many takeoffs and landings I did and so on. In the first place, on the CEDAR, total CDR test for operations, there were 250 for total, for 250 for everybody total, 250 for the uh, single and twin ski, and it's by Shannon and Richburg. They did 157 operations, and I did 93, which was 46 hours of flight time in four months. I said I did 93 tests by the two airplanes, and again, and 46 hours of flight time, which is in process in four four months. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.